Mr Speaker, as I stand here, men, women and children are huddled in basements across Ukraine seeking protection. Soldiers and citizens alike have taken up arms to defend their land and families. The sorrow we feel for their suffering and admiration for their bravery is only matched by the gratitude we feel for the security in which we live. And what underpins that security is the strength of our economy. It gives us the ability to fund the armed forces we need to maintain our liberty, the resources we need to support our allies, the power to impose sanctions which cause severe economic costs, and the flexibility to support businesses and individuals through crises as they emerge. But, Mr Speaker, we should be in no doubt. Behind Putin's invasion is a dangerous calculation that democracies are divided, politically weak and economically insecure, incapable of making tough long-term decisions to strengthen our economies. Mr Speaker, this calculation is mistaken. What the authoritarian mind perceives as division, we know are the passionate disagreements at the heart of our living, breathing democracy. What they see as chaos, we know is the freedom to be dynamic and innovative, and what they call the inherent weakness of open societies and free economies, we know is the source of our strength. We will confront this challenge to our values, not just in the arms and resources we send to Ukraine but in strengthening our economy here at home. So when I talk about security, yes, I mean responding to the war in Ukraine, but I also mean the security of a faster growing economy, the security of more resilient public finances, and security for working families as we help with the cost of living. Mr Speaker, today's statement builds a stronger, more secure economy for the United Kingdom. We have a moral responsibility to use our economic strength to support Ukraine and working with international partners to impose severe costs on Putin's regime. We are supplying military aid to help Ukraine defend its borders, providing around £400 million in economic and humanitarian aid as well as up to half a billion dollars in multilateral financial guarantees, and launching the new Homes for Ukraine scheme to make sure those forced to flee have a route to safety here in the UK. And we are imposing sanctions of unprecedented scale and scope. We have sanctioned over a thousand individuals, entities and subsidiaries, frozen the assets of major Russian banks, imposed punitive tariffs on tea products, restricted Russia's access to sterling clearing, to insurance, to the UK's capital markets, to SWIFT, and we have targeted the Russian central bank too. Be in no doubt these sanctions coordinated with our allies are working. The Russian ruble plummeted to record lows. The Moscow Stock Exchange has been largely suspended for a month, and the Central Bank of Russia has been forced to more than double interest rates to 20 per cent. We warned that an aggressive, unprovoked invasion would be met with severe economic costs, and it has. I am proud to say, as the whole House will say, we stand with Ukraine. But, Mr Speaker, the actions we have taken to sanction Putin's regime are not cost-free for us at home. The invasion of Ukraine presents a risk to our recovery, as it does to countries around the world. We came into this crisis with our economy growing faster than expected, with the UK having the highest growth rate in the G7 last year. But the OBR has said specifically there is unusually high uncertainty around the outlook. It is too early to know the full impact of the Ukraine war on the UK economy. But their initial view, combined with high global inflation and continuing supply chain pressures, means the OBR now forecasts growth this year of 3.8 per cent. 
The OBR then expect the economy to grow by 1.8% in 2023 and 2.1%, 1.8% and 1.7% in the following three years. The House will take comfort that the lower growth outlook has not affected our strong jobs performance. Unemployment is now forecast to be lower in every year of the forecast. It is already at 3.9 per cent back to the low levels we saw before the pandemic. But, Mr Speaker, the war's most significant impact domestically is on the cost of living. Covid and global factors meant goods and energy prices were already high. Statistics published this morning show that inflation in February was 6.2 per cent, lower than the US and broadly in line with the euro area. Disruptions to global supply chains and energy markets, combined with the economic response to Putin's aggression, mean the OBR expect inflation to rise further, averaging 7.4 per cent this year. As I said last month, the Government will support the British people as they deal with the rising costs of energy. People should know that we will stand by them, as we have throughout the last two years. That is why we have announced a £9 billion plan to help around 28 million households pay around half the April increase in the energy price cap. And people should be reassured that the energy price cap will protect their energy bills between now and the autumn. But I want to help people now, so I am announcing three immediate measures. First, I am going to help motorists. Today, I can announce for only the second time in 20 years, fuel duty will be cut. Not by one, not even by two, but by five pence per litre. The biggest cut to all fuel duty rates ever. And while some have called for the cut to last until August, I have decided it will be in place until March next year, a full 12 months. Together with the freeze, it is a tax cut this year for hard-working families and businesses worth over £5 billion, and it will take effect from 6 p.m. tonight. Second, as energy costs rise, we know that energy efficiency will make a big difference to bills. But if homeowners want to install energy-saving materials, at the moment, only some items qualify for a 5% VAT relief, and there are complex rules about who is eligible. The relief used to be more generous, but from 2019, the European Court of Justice required us to restrict its eligibility. But thanks to Brexit, we are no longer constrained by EU law. So I can announce for the next five years Homeowners having materials like solar panels, heat pumps, or insulation installed will no longer pay 5% VAT, they will pay zero. Yeah. We will also reverse the EU's decision to take wind and water turbines out of scope and zero rate them as well. Yeah. And we will abolish all the red tape imposed on us by the EU. Yeah. A family having a solar panel set installed will see tax savings worth £1,000 and savings on their energy bill of over £300 per year. And, Mr Speaker, this policy highlights the deficiencies in the Northern Ireland Protocol, because we won't immediately be able to apply it to Northern Ireland, but we will be raising it with the Commission as a matter of urgency. And I want to reassure members from Northern Ireland that the Executive will receive a Barnet share of the value of the relief until it can be introduced UK-wide. And the Prime Minister will bring forward further measures to reinforce our long-term energy security in the coming weeks. And finally, I want to do more to help our most vulnerable households with rising costs. They need targeted support. So I am doubling the Household Support Fund to a billion pounds, with £500 million of new funding. Local authorities, Mr Speaker, are best placed to help those in need in their local areas, and they will receive this funding 
from April. Mr Speaker, we can only afford to provide this extra support because of our stronger economy and the tough but responsible decisions we have taken to rebuild our fiscal resilience. Today's forecasts confirm, even after the measures I am announcing today, we are meeting all our fiscal rules. Underlying debt is expected to fall steadily from 83.5% of GDP in 2022-23 to 79.8% in 2026-27. Borrowing as a percentage of GDP is 5.4% this year, 3.9% next year, then 1.9, 1.3, 1.2 and 1.1% in the following years. At a time when the OBR have said that our fiscal headroom could be wiped out by relatively small changes to the economic outlook, it is right that the central fiscal judgment I am making today is to meet our fiscal rules with a margin of safety. The OBR have not accounted for the full impacts of the war in Ukraine. And we should be prepared for the economy and public finances to worsen potentially significantly. And the cost of borrowing is continuing to rise. In the next financial year, we are forecast to spend £83 billion on debt interest, the highest on record, and almost four times the amount we spent last year. That's why, Mr Speaker, we have already taken difficult decisions with the public finances, and that is why we will continue to weigh carefully calls for additional public spending. More borrowing is not cost or risk-free. I said it last autumn, and I say it again today. Borrowing down, debt down. Only the Conservatives can be trusted with taxpayers' money. So, Mr Speaker, our response to the immediate crisis in Ukraine has been unwavering, but we must be equally bold in response to the deeper and more fundamental challenge Putin poses to our values. We must show the world that freedom and democracy remain the best route to peace, prosperity and happiness. We will do so by strengthening our economy here at home. To that end, we are helping families with the cost of living creating the conditions for accelerated growth and productivity, and making sure the proceeds of growth are shared fairly. That is not the work of any one statement, but it does begin today and with one of our most important levers, the tax system. I told the House last autumn my overarching ambition was to reduce taxes by the end of this Parliament, and we will do so in a way that is responsible and sustainable. Today, I am publishing a tax plan. We will take a principled approach to cutting taxes, maintaining space against our fiscal rules, as I have done today, continuing to be disciplined with the first call on any extra resources being lower taxes, not higher spending, and, of course, carefully considering the broader macroeconomic outlook. With those principles in mind, our new tax plan will build a stronger economy by reducing and reforming taxes over this Parliament in three ways. First, we will help families with the cost of living. Second, we will create the conditions for higher growth. And third, we will share the proceeds of growth fairly, ensuring people are left with more of their own money. Let me take each in turn. Mr Speaker, there is now a dedicated funding source for the country's top priority, the NHS and social care, providing funding over the long term as demand grows, with every penny going straight to health and care. If it goes, then so does the funding, and that funding is needed now, especially as my right hon. Friend, the Health Secretary's plans to reform health care will ensure every pound of taxpayers' money is well spent. When I said, when I said the Conservatives 
when I said the Conservatives were the party of public services, the party of the NHS. I didn't just mean when it was easy. It is a total commitment. So it is right that the health and care levy stays, but a long-term funding solution for the NHS and social care is not incompatible with reducing taxes on working families. Over the last decade, it has been a Conservative mission to promote tax cuts for working people and simplify the system. That's why, that's why Conservative-led governments raised the income tax personal allowance from £6,500 in 2010 to the new level of £12,570. But the equivalent thresholds in national insurance which define how much people can earn nicks free are still around £3,000 less. Now, the Prime Minister pledged in the 2019 election we would increase those thresholds. We made a big step towards that goal in my first budget in 2020, increasing the national insurance threshold to £9,500. Today, we take the next step. Our current plan is to increase the NICS threshold this year by £300. But I'm not going to do that, Mr Speaker. I'm going to increase it by the full £3,000. Delivering our promise to fully equalise the NICS and income tax thresholds. And not incrementally over many years, but in one go this year. From this July, people will be able to earn £12,570 a year without paying a single penny of income tax or national insurance. That is a £6 billion personal tax cut for 30 million people across the United Kingdom. A tax cut for employees worth over £330 a year. The largest increase in a basic rate threshold ever and the largest single personal tax cut in a decade. The Institute, the Institute for Fiscal Studies has called it the best way to help low and middle earners through the tax system. It creates what the Centre for Policy Studies has called a universal working income. It is a tax cut that rewards work. And Mr Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, around 70% of all workers will have their taxes cut by more than the amount they'll pay through the new levy. Once again, showing it is this Conservative government delivering for hard working families and helping with the cost of living. So, Mr. Speaker, the first part of our tax plan for a stronger economy is to support families with the cost of living. But as I set out in last month's May's lecture, to lift our growth and productivity, we need the private sector to train more, invest more and innovate more. People, capital, ideas. That's how we'll create a new culture of enterprise, the second part of our tax plan. The plan sets out tax-cutting options on business investment and innovation with final decisions to be announced in the autumn budget. But these are significant and complex questions, so we will work with businesses over the summer to get the answers right. Let me explain to the House the direction of travel. First, people. We lag international peers in adult technical skills. Just 18% of 25 to 64-year-olds hold vocational qualifications, a third lower than the OECD average. And UK employers spend just half the European average on training their employees. So we will consider whether the current tax system, including the operation of the apprenticeship levy, is doing enough to incentivise businesses to invest in the right kinds of training. Second, ideas. Over the last 50 years, innovation drove around half the UK's productivity growth. But since the financial crisis, the rate of increase has slowed more than in other countries. And our lower rate of innovation explains almost all our productivity gap with the United States. Right now, right now we know that the amount businesses spend on R&D as a percentage of GDP is less than half 
the OECD average. And that is despite us spending more on tax reliefs than almost every other country. Something is not working. So we'll reform R&D tax credits so that they're effective and better value for money. We'll expand the generosity of the reliefs to include data, cloud computing and pure maths. And we'll consider in the autumn whether to make the R&D expenditure credit more generous. Third, capital. Weak private sector investment is a long-standing cause of our productivity gap internationally. Capital investment by UK businesses is considerably lower than the OECD average of 14%. And it accounts for fully half our productivity gap with France and Germany. Once the super deduction ends next year, our overall tax treatment for capital investment will be far less generous than other advanced economies. We're going to fix that. In the autumn budget, we will cut the tax rates on business investment. And I look forward to discussing the best ways to do that with businesses. People, capital, ideas. Three priorities for business tax cuts this autumn. But Mr Speaker, I want to help smaller businesses right now. So let me remind the House of our plan. Our business rates discount will take effect in April for retail, hospitality and leisure businesses. They will get a 50% discount on their business rates bill up to £110,000. A typical pub will save £5,000. That's a tax cut for hundreds of thousands of small businesses worth £1.7 billion, taking effect in just a week's time. Our Help to Grow Management Scheme offers businesses mini-MBAs, 90% funded by government, a benefit worth several thousand pounds. Help to Grow Digital gives businesses a 50% discount on buying new software, up to £5,000. We've also increased the annual investment allowance to a million pounds so that small and medium-sized businesses will feel the benefit of full expensing. But, Mr Speaker, I want to respond to the specific calls from small businesses with one further announcement today. The employment allowance cuts small businesses' tax bills, making it cheaper to employ workers. In my first budget two years ago, I increased that allowance. Today, I'm going further. From April, the employment allowance will increase to £5,000. That's a new tax cut worth up to £1,000 for half a million small businesses starting in just two weeks' time. So, Mr Speaker, future tax cuts on business investment and innovation, a business rates discount worth £1.7 billion, help to grow schemes worth thousands of pounds per business, an annual investment allowance worth up to a million pounds, and a new tax cut on the cost of employment worth £1,000 per company. Once again, Mr Speaker, it is this Conservative government delivering for British business. Mr Speaker, the tax plan I have announced today will help people and businesses deal with rising costs, will help raise the future growth rate of this country, but we want the proceeds of growth shared fairly, the third objective of our tax plan. The knowledge you can keep more of what you earn is a powerful incentive for people to work hard. It means greater economic security. And we know that individuals spend their money better than governments do. Yeah. We've, already, we've already announced today the equalisation of personal tax thresholds, giving over 30 million workers a tax cut worth over £330. And over time, I want to go further. But tax cuts must be paid for. They must be prioritised and they must fit the economic circumstances of the time. A clear goal for Conservative chancellors, and even some Labour ones, has been to cut income tax. The fact this has happened only twice in 20 years tells you how hard it is to do. Covid and the war in Ukraine have only added to the difficulty of achieving this by the end of this Parliament. I am sure all members of this House recognise and understand those challenges. It would clearly be irresponsible to meet this ambition this year, and yet I refuse to let that ambition wither and drift. Yeah. Yeah. 
By 2024, the OBR currently expects inflation to be back under control, debt falling sustainably, and the economy growing. Our fiscal rules are met with a clear margin of safety. And so my final announcement today is this. I can confirm before the end of this Parliament in 2024, for the first time in 16 years, the basic rate of income tax will be cut from 20 to 19 pence in the pound. A tax cut for workers, for pensioners, for savers. A £5 billion tax cut for 30 million people. And let me be clear with the House, it is fully costed and fully paid for in the plans announced today. Last year, I told the House I would cut taxes for hard-working families, but I would do so in a responsible and sustainable way. And today, I am delivering on that promise. So let me say this. Cutting taxes is not easy. It requires hard work, prioritisation and the willingness to make difficult and often unpopular arguments elsewhere. It is only because this Government has been prepared to make those difficult but responsible choices to fix our public finances that I can stand here and tell this House that not only are taxes being cut, but the debt is also falling whilst public spending is increasing. This doesn't happen by accident, Mr Speaker. We can deliver for the British people today and into the future, because unlike the party opposite, we have a plan. A plan, a plan that reforms and improves public services. A plan to grow our economy. A plan to level up across the United Kingdom. A plan that helps families with the cost of living. And yes, a tax plan that cuts taxes on working families by over £330, cuts taxes on fuel by five pence a litre, cuts taxes on business, and yes, for the first time in a long time, cuts income tax. Mr Speaker, let me end end by simply saying this. My tax plan delivers the biggest net cut to personal taxes in over And quite rightly, the House heard the Chancellor. I now want to show the same respect to the shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today was the day that the Chancellor could have put a windfall tax on oil and gas yeah. producers yeah. to provide real help to families. But he didn't. Today was the day the Chancellor could have set out a proper plan to support businesses and create good jobs, but he didn't. Today was the day that he could have properly scrapped his national insurance hike. He didn't. We said it was the wrong tax at the wrong time, the wrong choice. Today the Chancellor has finally admitted he got that one wrong. Inflation is at its highest level for 30 years and rising. Energy prices at record highs. People are worried sick. For all his words, it is clear that the Chancellor does not understand the scale of the challenge. He talks about providing security for working families, but his choices are making the cost of living crisis worse, not better. Mr. Speaker, The situation following Putin's criminal assault on Ukraine remains gravely serious. Just one month after the invasion, so much has changed, with repercussions for years to come. But the Chancellor has failed today to explain why he chose to sign off on a reduction in our country's armed forces last October. Will the Chancellor confirm if the government's target army size is still being reduced by 10,000 troops. And let me say this to the Chancellor. Labour will support whatever is needed on defence and security to keep our country safe. 
Mr. Speaker, the tremors following Putin's aggression will impact on Britain, including economically. But the cost of living crisis predates Putin's attack on Ukraine. In October, inflation was already forecast to be double the Bank of England's target. And yet the Prime Minister said that fears of inflation were unfounded. Today we learned that inflation has reached 6.2% and is expected to go higher in the coming months. People are rightly looking to their government to help them weather this storm. Yeah. Labour will support sensible measures to ease this pressure, but what the Chancellor has announced today says everything we need to know about his priorities. Yeah. Yeah. The cost of living crisis is hitting, hitting people particularly hard because incomes have been squeezed during the last 12 years of Conservative exactly. governments. Exactly. Ordinary families, disabled people, pensioners, facing really difficult choices. Mums skipping meals so that their children don't. Families struggling to buy new school shoes and uniforms for their children. Older people hesitating to put the heating on Absolutely. because they're worried about the cost. Yeah. Yeah. The At the weekend, the Chancellor was asked about fuel poverty, and he didn't even know the numbers. It is shameful that he doesn't, because when Martin Lewis predicts that 10 million people could be pushed into fuel poverty, the Chancellor should sit up and listen. And we know that pensions and security are not going to keep up with inflation. Pensioners and those on Social Security will be getting a real terms cut yep. in their incomes. Yep. Cutting the pension. So what analysis has the Chancellor done on the impact of benefits being uprated by less than inflation? Yep. Yep. How many more children and pensioners will drift into poverty exactly. because of the exactly. choices of this exactly. Government? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Cutting the pension. And who does the Chancellor prioritise? He continues to defend the record profits of oil and gas producers, yeah, yeah, yeah. who themselves admit that they have more money than they know what to do with. Yeah, 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 yeah. BP describes this crisis as a cash machine for them, but it is British people who are paying out. And it is deeply reg regrettable that the SNP have joined the Tories in wanting to shield oil and gas producers from Labour's progressive measures. When I, when I set out, when I set out, when I set out Labour's plans for a windfall tax in January, we estimated that it would have raised £1.2 billion. Now, because of the continued rise in global oil and gas prices, it would today raise over £3 billion. That's money that could be used to help families and pensioners and businesses. With a cut to VAT, a real Brexit dividend that would help working families and pensioners across our country. And a targeted warm homes discount that would see families and pensioners on the lowest and modest incomes being supported by £600. Now, that today the Chancellor comes along after 12 years of failure on energy efficiency and announces a VAT cut on building materials. This is wholly inadequate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A proper energy efficiency scheme, like the one we have set out, yeah. could cut bills by £400 to people from next year. And the silence from the Chancellor on our energy intensive manufacturing industries is appalling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At this time of national crisis, People and businesses need a government that is on their side. Yeah. Now, the Chancellor spoke of difficult choices, and I agree, there are always choices to be made, like who to tax and who to shield. Despite the Chancellor's reluctant measures, the facts are that he is still taking money out of people's purses and wallets with an increase in national insurance contributions. Yeah. 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 The changes that he is making today begs the question, why did he embark on these changes in the first place, despite the warnings from the Labour Party and from many, many others? Now, it's one thing for the Prime Minister and Chancellor to disagree with each other, but the centrepiece of the statement that the Chancellor has delivered today is based on a disagreement with himself. Yeah. <laughs> and for all his tax rising, 
on millions in the middle, where is the increased tax contribution for the very wealthiest in society? A landlord with a large number of properties won't be paying a penny more in taxes, but their tenants will. Someone with significant income from buying and selling stocks and shares won't be paying any more in tax, but those people powering our economy will. The Chancellor has made the wrong choices. Now, the Chancellor says we can't help everyone, and that's absolutely true. But who has the Chancellor been helping out? Those who have been swindling the taxpayer. The Chancellor left open the vaults for widespread waste, crony contracts and a frenzy of fraud. It was, as his former Tory Treasury Minister put it, Happy days if you are a crook. Seven billion items of PPE not usable and now being burnt. Taxpayers' money literally going up in smoke. Three and a half billion pounds worth of contracts awarded to friends, donors and pub landlords. And it gets worse. The Chancellor has been signing cheques to fraudsters, including organised criminals and drug dealers. Let's put the Chancellor's fraud failure in context. He has lost a staggering £11.8 billion of public money to fraud. This is twice the amount that a previous Conservative government lost on Black Wednesday. As a result of, let's face it, this jaw-dropping incompetence, the Conservatives have been funding crime instead of fighting it. And now the Chancellor has the audacity to come to British taxpayers asking them to pay more to fill his black hole. But there can be no cover-up to hide political embarrassment. Let's call in the National Crime Agency to investigate. We need answers, people held to account, because let's be clear, taxpayers want their money back. The truth is, Mr Speaker, People can no longer afford the Conservatives. Working families can't, pensioners can't, and businesses can't. The weak growth forecast we've seen today should be flashing red on the Chancellor's desk. And the Chancellor says in his statement today that the work starts today. Is he serious? The Conservatives have been in government now for 12 years. Not not 12 hours. What has taken them so long? Because since his party entered government, the UK has experienced the biggest downgrade in growth of any major economy. With the last Labour government, economic growth was 2.1% a year. Under the last 12 years of the Conservatives, it's averaged 1.5%. And now we know that growth has been downgraded this year too. Now, growth is essential for funding our public services, keeping taxes under control and keeping a handle on public finances too. That's why Labour have announced a tough set of fiscal rules to get our debt and our deficit down. But the truth is that because of this government's failure to get the economy growing, it's this Chancellor that has to put up taxes on families and businesses a staggering 15 times. This Chancellor has raised taxes more in the last two years than any previous Chancellor in the last 50. Now, he says it's all down to the pandemic, but the truth is The Conservatives have become the party of high taxation because they are the party of low growth. Now, I understand that the Chancellor has a portrait of Nigel Lawson above his desk. Well, today we've got an energy price crisis. Record prices at the pumps. Inflation is back. The truth is, he's not Nigel Lawson, Mr Speaker. He's Ted Heath, with an Instagram account. (laughs) Labour would be getting the economy firing on all cylinders 
ensuring that we buy, make and sell more in Britain, scrapping business rates and replacing them with a fairer system fit for the 21st century, something that small businesses and high street businesses are crying out for, and the Chancellor mentioned it not at all in his statement today. A climate investment pledge to decarbonise the economy, create good jobs in every part of Britain, and strengthen our energy security too. Businesses are seeing unprecedented increases in their costs right now. But all we hear from this Chancellor today is a promise of jam tomorrow, rather than the support that is needed now. And today's statement lacks the long-term plan for productivity, skills and growth. Where is it, Chancellor? Mr Speaker, I can't help but feel that in both the Chancellor's recent May's lecture and in his statement today, we are presented with increasingly incredible claims. Perhaps the Chancellor has been taking inspiration from the characters in Alice in Wonderland, or should I say, Alice in Sunak land. <laughs> because nothing here is quite as it seems either. It's the sort of place where a Chancellor celebrates giving people £200 to help them with their spiralling energy bills before explaining that he needs it all back. In Sunakland, the Chancellor proclaims, I believe in lower taxes, while at the same time as hiking Alice's national insurance contributions. So Alice asks the Chancellor, when did lower taxes mean higher taxes? Has down really become the new up? The Chancellor follows Humpty Dumpty's advice and says, when I use the word, it means just what I choose it to mean, <laughs> neither more nor less. Yeah. Now, Alice knows that under the Conservatives, taxes are at their highest level in decades yeah. as a result of the policies of this very same yeah. Chancellor. Yeah. In fact, this yeah. Chancellor was the only G7 Finance Minister to raise taxes on working people oh, during yeah. this crucial year of recovery. Yeah. Curious, sir? and curiouser. <laughs> As Alice climbs out of the rabbit hole to leave Sunak land, she recalls the words of the white rabbit and concludes that perhaps the Chancellor's reality is just different from yours. <laughs> the actual reality, Mr Speaker, is that this Chancellor's failure to back a windfall tax and his stubborn desire to pursue a national insurance tax rise are the wrong choices. In eight days' time, people's energy bills will be rising by 54 per cent. Two weeks today, the Chancellor's latest tax hike will start hitting working people and their employers. His national insurance tax rise was a bad idea last September, and he's admitted it's an even worse one today. The Chancellor is making an historic mistake. Today was the day to scrap the tax rise on jobs. Today was the day to bring forward a windfall tax. Today was the day for the Chancellor to set out a plan to support British businesses. But on the basis of the statement today and the misguided choices of this Chancellor, families and businesses will from now on endure significant hardship as a result. The Chancellor has failed to appreciate the scale of the challenge that we face, and yet again, he is making the wrong choices for our country. Uh, well, Ms. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank the Honourable Lady for her reply. And she raised a number of points, which I'll, of course, come into in due course. But I must say, listening to her statement, it did sound as if COVID and the huge damage that it had done to our economy and public finances had never actually happened. It sounded as if we didn't need to do things like furlough or support businesses and provide emergency funding to schools, the councils and, yes, the NHS. Because whilst her party supported all of those policies at the time, they now seem unwilling to pay for them. And there is a pattern there, Mr Speaker. They're always happy to spend taxpayers' money, just not take care of it. 
Let me, Mr. Speaker, just briefly address some of the specific points that the honourable lady uh, mentioned. I thought it's telling that she opened her statement uh, yet again calling for a windfall tax. Uh, we know on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we want to encourage more investment yeah. in the North Sea. We want more domestic energy. We want more jobs for the UK. And a windfall tax would put that off, which is why we then, Prime Minister, we're bringing forward a comprehensive energy security strategy in the coming weeks to address that. Uh, she talked about business rates and supporting businesses, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in just uh, d- just a week's time, uh, small businesses will be getting a 50% discount on their business rates bill in the retail, hospitality and leisure sector. It's the biggest tax cut to business rates outside of coronavirus since the business rate system was created. £1.7 billion. And, and I know she's said that she would like to abolish business rates. Uh, she also says she has some fiscal rules. I haven't quite figured out where she's going to pay for the £25 billion uh, of tax cuts that that involves, but I look forward to hearing it. She talked about defence spending, Mr Speaker. I must say here, I mean, we, it's all very well to talk about the size of the army. At least, uh, at least the party opposite now seems to think that we should actually have an army, uh, which, is a, which is a welcome conversion, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, it, it was because, we, because it was because how seriously we take this nation's security, Mr. Speaker, that in 2020, when we decided to do just short-term spending settlements for most departments, there was one department we singled out for special treatment. One department that got a four-year settlement in advance of everyone else, and that was the Ministry of Defence, Mr. Speaker. And in that settlement, they received 24 billion pounds of new cash the largest uplift to defence spending since the end of the Cold War, ensuring that we are not just the second largest spender in Europe in NATO, but the fifth largest in the world, a record that we on this side of the House are very proud of. She talked also, uh, Mr Speaker, about pensions again. Uh, thanks to the actions of this government since 2010, Conservative-led government, we'd have, we put in place the triple lock, not something that the party opposite ever did when they were in power. It means that pensions are now £2,300 higher than they were in 2010 and £700 more than if the triple lock hadn't been in existence during that time. And I'm pleased to say, Mr Speaker, that the state pension now relative to earnings is at the highest level it has been in over 30 years. This party will always be on the side of pensioners, Mr Speaker. Uh, and, then, and then just briefly to turn uh, to her comments on tax, and I'm not sure perhaps if she, and, uh, fair enough, it, it's, it's a short time to respond, Mr Speaker, if she fully understood the implications of the tax cut that was announced today. The increase in national insurance thresholds to fully equalise them is a £6 billion pound tax cut for 30 million UK workers. It is the largest increase in thresholds ever, the biggest personal tax cut in a decade, and it is worth £330 for those workers, Mr Sticker. And it means, and it means, and this is the part that I don't know if she's realised, because she talked about the levy and making sure that we direct our policy at those who need our help. There's a reason the Institute, Independent Institute for Fiscal Studies, called this the best way to help low and middle earners through the tax system, and that is because that is because 70% of workers will pay less tax, even accounting for the levy, Mr. Speaker. It is more generous than the policy she is advocating. And combined with the other tax cuts we've announced today, Mr. Speaker, as I said, this plan represents the biggest cut, the biggest net cut to personal taxes in a quarter of a century. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, let, me, let me conclude by, by saying this. The plan that we've announced today, as I said, has only been possible because we have taken tough decisions with the public finances and not necessarily always popular, but always responsible and always honest. It is two years to the day, Mr. Speaker, that the country first entered lockdown and suffered the biggest economic shock in over 300 years. An unprecedented collective national effort was undertaken. And two years later, this government hasn't only fixed the public finances, but people are back in jobs, debt is falling, and taxes are now being cut. Now, no government gets every call right. We learn from our mistakes. We strive to improve. But even if they won't admit it, Mr Speaker, members opposite will recognise this day as an achievement which we all can celebrate. I've said it before to the party opposite, and I'll say it again. 
there is a fine line between reasonable criticism and political opportunism. And in my experience, the British people can always tell the difference. Other in the House, Sir Peter Bottomley. I think the Shadow Chancellor's remarks were best remembered when she pointed out the Conservatives won the 2010 election and we won the 2019 election. And it's probably a very good thing for the country that we did. Yeah. The, Chancellor, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Chancellor has met the major obligations which have public spending, which helps the economy to grow, which allows for more jobs and more government revenue coming in. And he's also concentrated, as he's pointed out just now, that the changes to national insurance do the things that Martin Lewis would applaud, as well as the institutes. And if you have those three people supporting, so my support, I may say so, it's, it's very welcome. Can I point out to him, ask him to remember that pensioners don't just have the state pension, many of them have fixed pensions on top and getting inflation down as fast as possible is vitally important to them. They can't go for a bigger pay increase if they're not at work. And can I finally say to him that some areas of public spending don't make it easy to have efficiencies. If teachers' salaries make up most of the cost of education, it's very important to make sure that we don't squeeze education and wreck our schools and the future of the pupils. On things like cladding, when amendments come to the Building Safety Bill from the Lords, can he please not keep his purse completely shut, but if money needs advancing so that people's homes can be safe and saleable, please consider that openly. Mr Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his support, and I think he's, uh, I think he's right to highlight some of the independent commentators who have supported the policies announced today. I'll, I'll just touch on one of the things he said, which is about education spending. I agree with him. It's vital for our country's future that we support our teachers and support our children. That's why the Prime Minister announced in total £5 billion of catch-up funding to help those children with the learning, recover the learning that they lost during the <laughs> pandemic. Also why we're raising per-pupil cash amounts by £1,500 over this Parliament and raising teachers' starting salaries to £30,000 pounds as our manifesto committed to. No comes the SNP spokesperson, Alison Thulas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, this, this tax plan that the Chancellor announced is very thin, it is lightweight and it is superficial and it is exactly what we have come to expect from this Chancellor. Yeah. Because what we heard today from the Chancellor was not enough. It was utterly detached from the needs of our constituents up and down these islands. This has been a cost of living crisis over a decade in the making, layer upon layer. Austerity, which stripped back public services and punished people through brutal social security cuts. Brexit, which has driven away skilled workers and increased costs for businesses and for individuals. Covid, where we saw public money splurged in its billions on crony contracts, while some people were entirely excluded from support, and now those who got support under SACE are expected to pay tax on it, just to add insult to injury. And now home energy costs, which were already soaring before the increase in hostilities in Ukraine, are forcing households to the brink. Inflation running at 6.2%, its highest in 30 years, hitting the poorest hardest. Food prices rising, especially for the basics, and food banks seeing record numbers of people coming through their doors. The Chancellor said he's going to increase the household support fund. But really, is that it? Is that it? Because people are desperate and they need a good deal more help than that. Mr Speaker, we know that sanctioning Russia is not cost-free. But the Tories cannot use this as a sleight of hand to distract from the layers of pain which lie beneath the current crisis. Each of these layers has seen political choices and opportunities for change squandered by this UK Tory government and its predecessors, and we see this again today. And this Chancellor has increased taxes more in two years than Gordon Brown did in ten, while people are struggling. The Treasury Select Committee issued a report this morning, and it says that the UK government must take further action to support UK households, in particular those on lower incomes, to management, manage the subsequent rise in energy and other costs. Now, his announcement on NICS is welcome. We've been calling for it yeah. for years. It's yeah. not something that the Chancellor should have brought today. It's something he should have brought a long time ago. And hiking national insurance is a tax on individuals, but also, Mr Speaker, a tax on jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Employers are already facing increased costs in energy and materials, and this is a pressure that many businesses will not be able to bear. SMEs in particular need more support. 
Hospitality and tourism in particular have struggled through the pandemic and now the Chancellor is moving VAT from 12.5% back to 20% at a time when consumers have much less money in their pockets. We in these benches called for this cut before the Chancellor brought it in and we support the UK Hospitality's That's Enough campaign. Mr Speaker, cutting universal credit by £20 a week at a time when people need it the most. Carly, a single mum, spoke at the gingerbread reception on Monday and told us all how important it was that that money was there because things are tighter than they have ever been. No further support for people on legacy benefits and disabled people who often face higher energy costs and have no option uh, in those costs. A taper put in place that only helps people that are in work. Benefits just not going far enough as they don't keep pace with inflation and a welfare cap that punishes people for their circumstances. And, a call, and an end to the triple lock and nothing for the waspy women outside campaigning yet today uh, still losing out on what should have rightfully been theirs. The Scottish Government, by contrast, is doing what it can within its limited budget to support people, uprating the eight Scottish security, uh, social security benefits that we control by 6%, increasing the Scottish child payment to £20 a week, a lifeline to families. This Government should be doing the same. Yeah. 5p off fuel is something, but it doesn't help those who are paying for trains and buses. The Chancellor cut air passenger duty during COP26, but he still offers nothing for the millions of commuters who use public transport every day. Mr Speaker, I don't know if the Chancellor has ever had a prepayment meter. I don't think they fit them. I don't think they fit them, Mr Speaker, for swimming pools. The four and a half million people across these islands. She says it's pathetic. Four and a half million people across these islands. Four and a half million people across these islands experiencing the stress and despair of watching the money run out on their prepayment meters. Prepayment customers, Mr Speaker, already pay higher bills than those in direct debit. And they may struggle even to access the Chancellor's heat now, pay later loan, if it doesn't go automatically, to pay back the debts on that meter. Mr Speaker, the Fuel Bank Foundation, who provide top-ups to those who are struggling yep. on prepayment meters, have seen a 75% increase in demand already. That's before the prices we are seeing now. Yeah, yeah. Nothing either from the Chancellor on customers on heating oil on, or LPG who must fill up by the tank. And L he those on heating oil have seen their tank costs of f for 500 litres in a tank go from £250 to between £600 and £900. These people have yep. no choice about how they get that energy. Where are they in the Chancellor's priorities no today? Well. Mr Speaker, nuclear, which the government touted an awful lot before the, the, the statement today and was missing from the Chancellor's statement, interestingly, is not the answer to reducing people's yeah. bills. It is slow and it is eye-wateringly expensive. Yeah. We know already from the nuclear financing bill that what the government already proposes will add £63 billion to people's energy bills. £63 billion, Mr Speaker. The government should instead be fixing the long-standing inequality of grid charging, investing more in onshore and offshore wind, in tidal and in solar, and bringing carbon capture and storage in the northeast of Scotland off their reserve bench now. Make it a real net zero transition worthy of the name. They could invest in a national programme of heat pumps, retrofitting and insulating. And I was glad to see his announcement on home energy efficiency and repairs because this is something we've called on for a very long time, Mr Speaker. But this paltry announcement does not go nearly far enough, not even meeting the significant home energy intervention Scotland is already making. Mr Speaker, this Chancellor has choices. He could have looked at windfall tax and profits, yes, to the shadow Chancellor, oil and gas, but also Amazon, Serco, Netflix, why should they not have to pay up for their mega profits during the pandemic? And the Chancellor has had a windfall of his own. Tax revenues are higher than expected. Mm -hmm. The deficit is 30 billion lower than planned. And looking at the OBR reports that came out today, VAT has gone up by 21.7 billion. 21.7 billion extra in the Chancellor's coffers. And self-assessment uh, uh, self up by 5.2 billion pounds than forecast late last year. This could have been used to cushion the cost of living crisis and to invest in renewables and to wean us off fossil fuel. 
Money saving expert Martin Lewis was stark in his warning in Sunday morning. He says, as the money saving expert has been known for this, I'm virtually out of tools to help people now. And he said while watching this that his head sunk. There is no help for people on energy. Mr. Speaker, in closing, people face a chance, a crisis that the Chancellor could have done more to avert, and he's made the choice in so many ways not to act. There's nothing in his announcement today for Scotland. And we on these benches look forward to the day when Scotland has a government with the full fiscal powers to make sure that all of our people, all of them, can have a decent standard of living and that no child goes to bed with an empty tummy and a cold home. Yeah. 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 The exchequer. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady said there's nothing in this statement for Scotland. I, maybe she missed the part about the UK-wide fuel duty cut, which will save a typical, together with the freeze, will save a typical driver £100 this year, typical van driver £200. Maybe she missed the part about the largest increase to personal tax thresholds ever, a £6 billion tax cut, which will help 2.4 million people in Scotland starting in just a few months' time, uh, or indeed the 75,000 businesses that benefit from the employment allowance. Again, a £1,000 tax cut for Scottish Sorry. businesses coming in very shortly. And actually, what I didn't hear from her, uh, Mr Speaker, she mentioned that Scotland wants, uh, as ever, more fiscal autonomy. Scotland already does have a considerable degree of fiscal autonomy. And what I didn't hear was whether the SNP are going to deliver the same income tax cut for Scottish taxpayers that the UK government is delivering as paid for in these numbers in 2024. I look forward to hearing from the Honourable Lady that the Scottish government will be cutting taxes for their taxpayers with the powers and funding uh, that they will get. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I, 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 always, I always want to make sure that we look after the most vulnerable in our society. The Honourable Lady mentioned a single mother uh, who she knew. I, I'm pleased and proud, in fact, that because of the actions of this government, increasing the national living wage in April by 6.6 per cent, by cutting the UC taper rate, uh, Mr Speaker, and indeed by the increase in personal thresholds today, taken all together, all tax and welfare changes, that single mother of two children working full-time on the national living wage will now be £1,600 better off. Mr Speaker, and then the last point I think the uh, Honourable Lady was talking about was um, was on businesses, and, and again, I'd say to her, we are providing a business rate discount for businesses, and Scotland, of course, has received the Barnet share of that money. Business rate discount here coming in for retail, hospitality, and leisure businesses in just a few weeks, and I know the Scottish Government will have the resources to do the same thing. And then, lastly, on prepayment meters, where the Honourable Lady made a comment. I'm acutely aware that millions of families rely on prepayment meters, which is why, when we designed the energy support package that we announced in Fenry, we had particular care to those people to make sure that they would receive the same benefit. And indeed, we found out and we made sure that 40% of them will automatically get the £200 rebate in October. And for the remainder, Mr Speaker, we are working with Bayes and the industry to ensure that all of those people get the same benefit as well. They will either receive a voucher, a cheque in the post, or indeed something called a special access message to their phone on SMS, so that when they go to one of the retailers that they use to top up their meter, they will also benefit from the actions that we have taken, because this Conservative government is on the side of everyone, Mr Speaker. Chair of the Select Committee, Mel Stride. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I broadly welcome my right honourable friend's uh, statement? The devil, of course, will always be in the detail, and we look forward to seeing him before the Treasury Select Committee next week, along with the OBR and various economists, including the IFX, to which my right honourable friend uh, has alluded. Um, I welcome the cut to fuel duty. It will help both motorists. Uh, and uh, consumers will be important for businesses as well. The VAT reduction uh, around energy efficiency and solar I think is very important in terms of the context of the sanctions on Russia at the moment and the importance of energy uh, self-sufficiency where we can achieve it. The hardship fund will be a very targeted measure uh, as well, which I think is important, and I know that small businesses will be delighted to have heard about the increase in the employment allowance to £5,000, which is a key ask of the Federation of Small uh, Businesses. Um, I, along with many others in this House, would like to have seen the national, uh, um, the NI uh, increases uh, for next year to have been scrapped in their entirety. But I have to say that uh, the increase in the threshold that my rightable friend 
uh, has announced today has been very significant indeed and far more significant <coughs> yeah, yeah. than I imagined uh, that it would be. The big question that my right honourable friend of course will be asked will be within the context of the fiscal targets that I think we're all agreed we need to meet, has he used enough of that headroom now as opposed to having it as a hedge against the uncertainties of the future to which he alluded and which are very real around inflation and interest rates and the effect of that on the cost of borrowing uh, to the government. So I just wonder whether I could ask him to speak a little bit more uh, about uh, his fiscal headroom. He will have had the advantage of seeing the OBR figures, which I have not, and what his assessment is of that, particularly around the deficit target. Um, secondly, Madam Deputy Speaker, on the issue of growth, when my right honourable friend has pointed out the OBR downgrades, which are not surprising in a high inflationary environment and the uh, effect that that will have on consumer demand, the dampening effect. I was very pleased that he referenced his May's lecture because it is going to yeah. be essential that we now focus yeah. on innovation, on yeah, people yes. yeah. and driving up capital investment. Uh, my right honourable friend made reference, I think, to a consultation around how to improve capital investment where we do currently lag behind our competitors in the G7. And I wonder if he could tell us a little bit more about the timeline for that consultation and when he expects to be able to provide um, important certainty for businesses in that respect. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker. I thank my honourable friend for his words of support. Just to briefly address his, his two substantive questions. Uh, the tax plan published today in the Spring Statement document has a range of options for how one could cut taxes on investment. I look forward to having that conversation with him, colleagues and the business community uh, about the right way to achieve the outcome we want, with final decisions to be announced in the autumn budget to take effect in spring 2023 after the super deduction ends. I won't get into the detail of them now. Uh, with regard to headroom, uh, we have about 1% of GDP headroom against both the stock and the flow rule, so both the debt falling and the borrowing rule. Uh, on the borrowing side, that's about in line with previous chancellors. On the stock rule, it's a bit less. Uh, the average over the last decade has been about 1.7%. Uh, but what I would say to him is the headroom includes the tax cut in 2024, so that has been fully paid for and costed uh, in these numbers. So I do believe we're taking a responsible and pragmatic approach. But he's right to point out the risk. The OBR have said that relatively small changes in the macroeconomic outlook could wipe out the entire headroom, which is why it's right we continue to be disciplined on public spending. Order, I would like to um, try to get everybody in. Um, that means uh, asking one question, um, not making short statements, but just asking one question so the Chancellor can answer one back. Dame Meg Hillier. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Earlier in Prime Minister's questions, the Prime Minister batted off a question about fraud uh, during COVID uh, by suggesting that it was just about delivering. But it was the Chancellor, Madam Deputy Speaker, that, wrote out, that gave the ministerial direction for the bounce back loans to be paid at such speed that even, without, well, even with a 48 hour longer check, they might have avoided the duplicate fraudulent claims that weren't <coughs> stopped until a month later. That £4.7 billion in fraud would have mitigated some of the measures, for example, the national insurance increase. Does he now regret that he didn't pause for thought and be more cautious on fraud? Yeah. Uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've got a lot of respect for the Honourable Lady, but on this matter I do believe she's wrong, and it's with incredible hindsight to now point out issues that at the time she and nor did anybody else raise. And in fact the opposite. I was here on a daily basis being told not to get money out in weeks or months, but to get money out in hours and days. Yeah. To put longer fraud checks in place would have taken weeks, Madam Deputy Speaker. So I do stand by the decision that we made. We have put various safeguards in place. We have blocked £2 billion of bounce-back loans, 60000 because of the checks at Companies House. The National Intelligence Service and NCA are now in the process of succeed, uh, successfully prosecuting dozens of people. We are striking people off from Companies House, and we are investing more today in the NCA, Natis and the British Business Bank, so they can work on the interventions that we know are doing very well. But I do think it is wrong to pretend now that they wanted to do something at the time, which they did not Greg Clark. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I congratulate the Chancellor on a tax cutting, uh, deficit cutting, tax simplifying statement, which is very much in the traditions of Nigel Lawson? Uh, he mentions research and development tax credits, uh, and we have a target to get to 2.4% of GDP by 
of investment in R&D across the economy by 2027. Are we on track for that? Uh, and when will the changes to R&D tax credits come into effect so that it can increase progress further on that? My uh, honourable friend for his support, and I know this is an area that he has particular interest and concern for. You know, on the government side, that 2.4% is comprised of two things, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's what the government spends, but also what private businesses spend. I can reassure him we are more than on track. Uh, for the government bit of that. We already spend the OECD average on the 2.4, and that will go up over the course of this Parliament by 50 per cent. So the government is doing its bit. As I said in the statement in the May's lecture, the private sector lags significantly internationally in terms of how much it spends. The changes we make to R&D will all come into effect uh, in spring next year, announced finally in the autumn budget. I look forward to working with him, his committee and others, uh, and he wrote a foreword for a very helpful report on this topic uh, so that we get these changes right and drive up private sector investment in R&D. Clive Betts. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In the Sheffield Star today, there are two stories. Um, Sheffield is still a city of steel. We have Ben McIver, the president of Forge Solutions Group, a company which employs 400 skilled workers in the steel industry, begging for help with the rise in energy costs, as they simply can't pass these costs onto their customers. And we have workers at Liberty Steel protesting about the broken promise from the Prime Minister that if we left the EU, he would cut energy bills for steel companies. Why has the Chancellor chosen to break the Prime Minister's promise? Well, no, Madam Deputy Speaker, we've provided over £2 billion worth of support uh, for energy intensive industries over the past several years, including, I believe, over £600 million for the steel industry. That comes in a variety of ways, whether it's free allowances or compensation on some of the uh, ETS and other carbon price mechanisms. Uh, we also, in the spending review, announced hundreds of millions of pounds to support industry to make the transition to using cleaner energy. Theresa Villiers. In the spending review, the Chancellor gave a lifeline to maintain nursery schools by confirming supplementary funding, but not all schools qualify for that funding. So can I appeal to him to work with the Education Secretary to identify the modest amount of additional funding needed to put all maintained nursery schools on a stable financial footing for the future? Well, my, my right honourable friend has championed this issue consistently uh, since I've had this job, and she deserves enormous credit for that. I'd be very happy to talk to her uh, and take up her proposals with the Department for Education as well. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It'd be surely not to accept that the Chancellor has sought to deal with many of the issues which face living, uh, working families today. But I believe that, given the windfall in taxes which he has experienced, that there could have been more done to help with fuel costs, energy bills, and other cost of living increases. Yeah. Significant that the Chancellor cannot apply all of his taxes to Northern Ireland because of Northern Ireland Protocol shows it need to be dealt with. But, Chancellor, you started off your the Chancellor started off his statement today referring to Ukraine, and yet surprisingly, there is nothing and no mention of additional resources for defence, the defence of this country, the defence of democracy, and the defence of the values in face of Putin's uh, aggression. Why, why is there an absence of this today? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, to the honourable gentleman who, who talked about uh, fiscal windfalls or headroom, I'd refer him to my answer to the uh, honourable member for the chair of the Select Committee. Uh, the headrooms we have are actually relatively small uh, by historical standards and can be wiped out very easily uh, by small changes in the macroeconomic outlook. So I think it's wrong to say uh, there is a huge uh, windfall. Indeed, borrowing for this forthcoming year will be higher than the proposal or the forecast was in October. Uh, and with regard to defence, again, I'd refer the honourable gentleman to my answer earlier to the, um, the lady opposite. Uh, we increased defence budget by £24 billion in 2020, the largest increase since the Cold War. It was the only party, the only uh, department that got a four-year settlement at a time when everyone else just got a one-year. That's how seriously we take the issue. Hugh Merriman. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I congratulate the Chancellor for this statement, and also, in particular, the 5p reduction in fuel duty, which I note is temporary. And would he remind all members of this House that temporary does not mean permanent? And that if it does become permanent, given it costs five billion, we will not be able to reduce income tax, which also costs five billion, if we're also to meet our tests of fiscal responsibility. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I, I thank my honourable friend, as, as, as ever, for his uh, support. He's right. Uh, the fuel duty cut will benefit all our constituents, particularly those in more rural areas and on lower incomes. He's also right to make the point, Mr. Speaker, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. We do need to remain disciplined on public spending. We have fully accounted for the income tax cut in these plans, but it will require collective discipline to deliver those tax cuts and others that we want to see happen over the remainder of this Parliament. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The government have been warned privately and publicly not to make it up when it comes to the employment statistics. So red alarms rang when the Chancellor of the Exchequer glossed over the employment numbers in his statement just now. But the small print reveals, Madam Deputy Speaker, that employment, that unemployment is forecast to rise next year and then plateau. So can I ask the Chancellor of the Exchequer, what are the Department for Work and Pensions playing at? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, unemployment is at almost a record low level at the moment, at 3.9 per cent. The forecasts are all in the OBR lower than they were in their October forecast, forecast and they all are continually still at very low levels, at around 4.2-ish throughout the forecast period. Uh, we're very proud of this government's track record on jobs, record numbers of people on payroll. Compared to the forecasts of millions of people unemployed, we've managed to successfully get everyone back to work with record number of job vacancies, and we will continue to focus on that. Sir Edward Lee. Um, with the world economy facing unparalleled challenges from at least two of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, death from plague and war, I wonder, for all the challenges facing the chance, if anybody seriously believes that after a decade of unfunded uh, spending promises, tax will be any lower under a Labour government? That's a question I think they should answer. But may I make one question on behalf of pensionable, people of pensionable age? More and more are having to wait a long time for so-called minor operations, up to two years, very debilitating and very painful. And more and more people, middle-income people, are dipping into their savings, going into debt to pay for private operations. Will the Chancellor have an open mind about giving help to these people with some sort of tax relief, if not on insurance, on the actual cost of the operation, if it's delayed for, say, up to two years? Uh, well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm always happy to take suggestions from my uh, honourable friend, um, but, uh, but also you know, he identifies a pressing problem that all of our constituents face, and that's waiting longer than we would like for particularly elective treatment. That's why every penny of our new health and care levy will go to the NHS and social care, so we can make a start on that backlog. We are backing the NHS to get those backlogs down, and my honourable friend is right to raise it. Sarah Olney. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, households are facing the biggest hit to living standards on record, um, and they were looking to the Chancellor today to offer them some hope. We also know from the OBR forecast that the Treasury will take an additional £13 billion in VAT thanks to inflation. Mm. So, can the Chancellor tell us why he hasn't announced an emergency cut to VAT, as yeah. the Liberal Democrats have called for, mm. putting £600 back into the pockets of the average family? That's an unfair tax that puts up prices for every single family in the exactly. UK, makes up half of all the taxes paid by the poorest households, compared to less than a fifth for yeah. the richest. Thank you. Here, here. Uh, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think it's wrong to say that there has been a VAT windfall. If the Honourable Lady looks at the numbers in the OBR forecast, she will see that their projection for VAT receipts for this forthcoming year are actually lower than their previous forecast in October. But we are helping working families, Madam Deputy Speaker, with a £6 billion cut, tax cut, £330 in the pockets of 30 million workers across the United Kingdom. Robert Jenrick. Madam Speaker, well, I think when the Chancellor gets back to his office, that portrait of uh, Nigel Lawson will be looking down admiringly on him. Yeah. This is a Conservative plan that we can all get behind. Very it rewards good. work, it gets the deficit down, and it actually incentivises investment by businesses rather than penalising them with windfall taxes. Energy prices, as my right hand friend knows, are very volatile, so he's right, I think, to stand by the £9 billion package he brought forward previously and wait until the next update on the energy price cap in late summer. If indeed it does show that energy prices are going to rise very substantially, that will have a big impact on the poorest households. Will my right hand friend give us an assurance that he will obviously keep this matter under review and will consider further measures, if necessary, to protect the poorest households? 
Uh, well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I can reassure my, well, I thank my honourable friend for his warm words of support, uh, but also reassure him, of course, we keep everything under review. As we have stood by the British people over the past two years, we will continue to stand by them. And it's thanks to the responsible decisions of this government that we are able to, when times call, to provide support that is required. Madam Deputy Speaker, consumer spending is vital for the growth of our economy in the aftermath of the pandemic. Yet, with inflation now at its highest level for 30 years, he's seen the data. Consu consumer confidence is declining, hitting our small businesses hard and setting back their recovery from the pandemic. So, why on earth is the Chancellor not fully U turning on his NICS rise at this time? A rise which the government itself has admitted will increase inflation and decrease spending power. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady may not have realised that for 70% of people, this is more generous than doing the thing that she suggests. They will pay less tax as a result of this policy uh, as opposed to the one that she is uh, advocating for. So I believe it's the right policy. We're on the side of hardworking people, and this will help them at a time that they need. Stephen Hammond. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Chancellor for his statement today, which has been warmly welcomed by the people and the businesses of Wimbledon, I can tell him. And can I commend him for his analysis of some of the challenges to the economy? One thing he could make move from temporary to permanent is the super deduction. And in his consultation, will he look at that? Because I think it's already evident that is the most effective way of changing behaviour and ensuring greater R&D and capital expenditure. Well, I thank my uh, honourable friend, and I look forward to discussing these topics with him over the coming months. There's a range of options outlined for how to cut taxes on investment in the uh, document today, uh, and hopefully he will have a chance to digest that, and I look forward to discussing it further with him. Stephen Timms. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The party opposite introduced universal credit, but instead of uprating it in line with current inflation, the Chancellor has chosen to increase the size of the Household Support Fund, <coughs> which, if you've heard of it, you have to go to the local council for. What evidence does he have, if any, that the Household Support Fund is effective in delivering help to those families who need help most? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, the feedback I get from colleagues is that it has been effective, and, it, and local councils I trust to know. I, lo I trust local councils to know in their area who the people are that most need our help. I used to be local government minister, and, and as the honourable gentleman knows, I have enormous respect and regard for our local authorities. Uh, but we didn't just do that, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. In the autumn budget, we cut the tax rate on universal credit—a two billion pound tax cut for almost two million of those on the lowest incomes on universal credit. Robert Halton. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I just want to thank my uh, right hon. Friends uh, heartily for the fuel duty cut and, mm -hmm. the, and the raising the threshold for the NI. I hope I can retire from campaigning on this particular yeah, issue. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, life, my life would be a lot easier. And he has stood up for workers and for people on low incomes, and we should not forget that. As he said, it's this party that is the, work, the true workers' yeah. party of the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Could I just ask him, on the apprentice, on the apprentice levy, on the apprenticeship levy, when he looks at the reform, can he make sure that apprenticeships may remain at the heart, that it focuses on getting more disadvantaged people to do apprentices, young people and uh, people doing degree apprentices? Well, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his uh, support. I can give him that reassurance. Apprenticeships are fantastic. We want to make sure they're continually supported, but we will look at all aspects to make sure that we're also incentivising the training that we, we want to see. Um, but he is right, Madam Deputy Speaker, to highlight that this part party is the party of the workers, and that is in no large part, that, thanks to his campaign, Jay rightly champions. John McDonnell. Can we, can we be absolutely clear that benefits and pensions are still going to rise by only 3.1 per cent? I'm desperately worried about in my constituency are those who are forced to live on benefit, largely through disability and health, and poorer pensioners. We know the energy prices are rising rapidly. The assistance he's provided so far will not enable them to cope, and I think when we get to November, they will be freezing in their own homes, and lives will be put at risk. One simple solution is to double the winter fuel allowance. I have just appealed to him, can he go away and think of that and come back sooner rather than later to give those very vulnerable people some confidence in the future? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, those, all the people that he mentioned will benefit from the proposals we put forward last month, £9 billion to help everybody. The doubling in the size of the Household Support Fund is there for his local council and others to support those most in need. And he's right to highlight the winter fuel payments, which are payments of up to £300 uh, for those pensioners. Uh, and many of them will also, those on pension credit, will have access to the Warms Home discount, Madam Deputy Speaker, which is an extra £150. Anthony Brown. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As a member of the Treasury Select Committee and Chair of the Conservative Backbench Treasury Committee, I, I congratulate the Chancellor on this uh, spring statement, tax cutting, tax simplifying, with many measures to help work hard-working families make ends meet and to promote economic growth. But I also very much welcome the publication of the tax plan. Too often governments are tactical about their tax policies, leaving great uncertainty for businesses about what's going to happen next. We now have a strategy for the years ahead. Now, tax policy has to be informed by a strategy. It needs to be credible and it also needs to be fair. Can my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, confirm that of all the measures the Treasury has introduced since 2019, that the poorest households have benefited the most and the wealthiest households have contributed the most? Thank my honourable friend uh, for his question uh, and, again, and also on his new appointment. I look forward to working with him and both his committees over the coming months to flesh out particularly the business tax options that we want to finalise by autumn budget. Um, and he, he is absolutely right. The distribution analysis published today, which looks at all tax, welfare and spending decisions, shows that this government has been highly progressive in its actions. Those on the lowest incomes have benefited the most. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Once again, quite incredibly, there is a climate-shaped hole at the heart of this statement. Once again, the Chancellor didn't even mention the word climate, which is all the more unforgivable since the measures that we need to tackle the climate crisis and the cost of living crisis are the same. Here, here. So with six million people now facing fuel poverty, can he tell us where is the home retrofit revolution and the investment that we need to make 19 million homes warmer by 2030, saving families £400 off their bills and creating hundreds of thousands of jobs in the process. Yeah. How many more people have to freeze in their homes before he'll act? Yeah. 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 Madam Deputy Speaker, we already acted in the spending review last autumn to outline billions of pounds to improve the energy efficiency of hundreds of thousands of homes across the country. She's right that that saves £300. We have grants available up to £20,000, depending on the scheme, that will do that over the remainder of this Parliament. Uh, but also the energy company, uh, ob en energy company obligation uh, does the same thing for hundreds of thousands of people in fuel poverty through energy bills. So we already did it. We're getting on with it. And she, think, I think, missed the fact that we just cut VAT today on energy-saving materials. Andrew Jones. Deputy Speaker, can I welcome the statement from the Chancellor today, particularly the way that the most support is being provided to those who will need it most. But can I ask specifically about the section on the R&D uh, review for the future. We're seeing much of our economy go digital. We're seeing increasing focus upon the knowledge economy and the creative sectors. Is that going to be at the core of his investment plans for the future? Because that is how we will secure future growth. My honourable friend as ever makes a very thoughtful point. Innovation broadly defined or multi-factor productivity is account of about half of our productivity growth. Uh, its pace has slowed recently. We need to reinvigorate it. I set out a strategy to do that in the May's lecture, but key to that will be driving up private sector investment in R&D and innovation, uh, and the tax cuts that we will put in place and reforms in the autumn will help us achieve that end. Clive Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I Chancellor confirm that uh, people on universal, for someone in employment on universal credit will see a, an increase in the taper between £9,500 and £12,500 of £1,290 clawback to the Chancellor. Can he say what he's doing to address that issue? Because that's the poorest workers in the, in, in, in the country facing a £1,290 increase in taxes. I, I think honourable, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is just describing how the taper works. It withdraws benefits as people's incomes rise. That is, the, that, is li that is literally how the system is designed. But what I can say is, because we took actions to cut the universal credit taper rate last autumn, we delivered a tax cut for two, uh, t of £2 billion for almost 2 million people. And as I said earlier, I gave the example of a single mother with two children renting and working full-time on the national living wage. As a result of all our changes, tax, welfare and wage, that person will be £1,600 better off. Richard Drax. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I commend my right honourable friend for his statement as far as he went? He's right. He can't print more money, he can't borrow more money, he can't spend more money. Can I just, can I just ask my honourable friend to bring, forward, to bring forward the tax cuts? 
particularly for the lower earners, because they, as he's rightly said, spend their money far more wisely than the government does, and we give them more cash in their pockets to meet these increasing bills. Yeah. Well, I, I thank my honourable friend. That is exactly what we are doing. The increase in the personal tax threshold we brought in in July is far quicker than uh, these things normally happen, but we wanted to do it as quickly as possible. That will put £330 in the pockets of 30 million people up and down the country. Lillian Greenwood. Thank you, Speaker. This year, the Chancellor is delivering the largest fall in living standards uh, yeah. since ONS records began in 1956 57. Wow. Will he tell us how many more people will fall into poverty as a result of his failure to ensure that increases in social security match inflation? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady is describing the impact of inflation on people's incomes. Of course, they're, they're going to have an impact. We've been very clear and honest about that. That isn't just happening here. It's happening everywhere uh, across the world as we grapple with higher inflation. But the measures we are ta taking today will make a significant difference to support working families, weather some of the challenges ahead. And again, for those who are most vulnerable, we started this journey in autumn with a cap tax cut to universal credit and, again, doubling the household support fund today to a £1 billion. Pounds. Ruth Edwards. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I welcome the Chancellor's statement today, which will do a lot to help many of my constituents in <coughs> Rushcliffe. Can he reassure me and my constituents that these tax-cutting measures announced today will continue to be the focus of this Conservative Government and are just the start of what's possible if we continue to build a stronger, greener economy? Here, here. <laughs> I thank my honourable friend. She's absolutely right. That we started in October. We made progress today, and the tax plan I published today shows that we'll continue to make progress, both cutting taxes for businesses and people over the remainder of this Parliament. In Paisley. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor is, of course, the Conservative and Unionist Chancellor for all of the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But isn't it the fact, by what he has stated in his comments today, that because of the uh, deficiencies in the Northern Ireland Protocol? that none of his flagship programme will actually apply to Northern Ireland until he goes cap in hand to the European commu community and seeks their permission to apply these, vac these VAT differentials to Northern Ireland. If the European community says no, what is the Conservative and Unionist Chancellor going to do for our part of the United Kingdom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, the, the Honourable Gentleman is right, and I have specifically highlighted the deficiency of the protocol, and I look forward to having those discussions with the Commission. Obviously, these are not particularly traded goods because they are installed, so there ought to be a very strong argument uh, that they are included, particularly as we are now all collectively grappling with an energy crisis. Um, I would not want to preempt the Foreign Secretary's uh, conversations on the protocol, but I think it is not right to say that the flagship policies do not apply to Northern Ireland. The the increase in the personal tax thresholds will, uh, the income tax cut will, and the fuel duty cut will, and I know that will be a benefit to his constituents and millions of others across Northern Ireland. Peter Alders. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome the announcements that my right honourable friend has made regarding national insurance thresholds, fuel duty, and the increase in the household support fund. The last two years have been very challenging for the poorest and most vulnerable, and it is going to get a whole lot tougher. As we saw with his swift and right decision to raise universal credit at the start of the pandemic, which was too hastily reduced, the best way of targeting support for those who need it is through the benefits system. Can I urge my right hon. Friend in the coming days and weeks to look very closely at the levels of and the means of uprating universal credit and other benefits? I well, thank my honourable friend. I, mean, I strongly believe the best way to help people sustainably is to move them off welfare and into work. Uh, that is what this government is doing. Our record on doing so is incredibly strong, and we are throwing literally the kitchen sink, both in terms of money and policies, which the IMF have described as well targeted, to support people as they make that transition and put more money in their pockets. Andy Macdonald. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the Chancellor really hasn't helped those in greatest need. The, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation says that the current uprating of working age social security benefits will mean 400,000 people falling into poverty this year. With inflation now forecast to average around 8% in 2023, will the Chancellor reflect on the very different circumstances the country finds itself in and uprate benefits? by the inflation rate forecast in the OBR's economic and fiscal outlook. 
Well, Madam Deputy Secretary, the way that benefits are uprated uh, and indeed pensions is the same every year. It's been the same way for over a decade. What we are doing, what we are doing, is making sure that we support people from welfare into work. It is the most sustainable way to help them. Someone moving from universal credit into full-time work at the national living wage is £6,000 better off. That's why I'm pleased, because of our management of the economy, there are now record numbers of job vacancies and support to help people get those jobs. Speaker, thousands of people across Grantham and Stanford will welcome the targeted measures announced by the Chancellor today. Does he agree, and can he reconfirm for the House that he agrees that the best way to tackle the cost of living issues that people face is through the dignity of a job and the security of a regular paycheck. And that is why that is why it's so important that unemployment, if you will listen, unemployment has fallen every single month for the last year, and he should welcome that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my my honourable friend is absolutely right and puts the point very eloquently. The best way to help people is to get them into work. That's why we're creating record numbers of jobs and then making sure that not only are those jobs well paid, but people keep more of the money they earn. That is the approach of this Conservative government. Yeah. Jim Farron. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There appears to be no plan from the Chancellor, glossy or otherwise, for farming and food security. Is he aware that hundreds and hundreds of farmers are leaving the industry because of the botching of the transition from the old basic payment system to the new system? If he were to peg the basic payment system at its current rate, rather than halving it over the next two years, he would at least give time for farmers to be able to catch up and get into the new schemes. As it stands, we are seeing farmers leave the industry just at the moment we're facing an international food security crisis. Will he rethink and back British farmers? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Ms, Madam Deputy Speaker, as, as the Honourable Gentleman, Honourable Gentleman knows well, given we are constituency neighbours, uh, there's plenty of farmers that I also represent and listen to their concerns. Uh, the Agriculture Secretary is doing an excellent job of transitioning from the old system to new. What I can say is that the overall funding for farming has been protected by this government, and the same level of funding is available as we promised it it would be. Uh, and I want to see more British food grown here, and I want to see our supporting British food. Of course I do, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I think the British public will as well. Mike Wood. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the Shadow Chancellor quoted money saving expert Martin Lewis's comments from before the spring statement, but since the statement, he's written that £3,000 rise of threshold to £12,570 is a gain of £330 a year and more than offsets the rise for many on lower incomes. Good call. Yeah. Just, just, just what proportion of, uh, of workers? will now be getting more money from the higher threshold than they pay in the health and social care levy. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for sharing that uh, helpful tweet with, uh, with the House, um, but I would say to him the number he's looking for is 70%. 70% of workers will pay less uh, because of the increase in thresholds, even taking into account the new levy, and that's why this, side is on the, this government is on the side of hard-working British taxpayers. Kate Green. I don't think the Chancellor understands the depth of despair and fear among the very lowest income households in this country, those, for example, whose incomes were already below the thresholds for national insurance or tax, those who have to rely on social security benefits because they're not able to work because of caring responsibilities or health or disability. To uprate benefits by less than half the rate of inflation at the same time as families face particular pressures on paying for the basics, energy and food, will simply leave those families destitute. Will the Chancellor please heed the calls from around the House this afternoon and look again at his benefits uprating policy? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, Madam Deputy Speaker, as, with, with regard to those who are most vulnerable, uh, as I said earlier, we are providing an extra half a billion pounds, doubling the size of the Household Support Fund. Local authorities are the best place to direct that funding, uh, but we do want to support people into work, and that's why uh, I'm proud of the record we have. Christy Buchan. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, I warmly welcome the tax cuts announced today, especially with their focus on low and middle earners. I note that the OBR has said today that interest payments on debt will quadruple next year. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that with interest payments on our debt at £80 billion that we do need to maintain discipline on spending going forward? 
My uh, honourable friend makes an excellent point. Uh, uh, she's absolutely right. The increase in debt payments is historic. Uh, and it gives a glimpse of what some of the risks facing us going forward are. That's why it's right that we maintain headroom against our fiscal rules. And the way to, best way to do that in order to deliver a lower tax economy is to remain very disciplined on further public spending. Dave Dugan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor of the Exchequer has detailed a small number of fiscal interventions, and I'll have a small mercy for the poorest in our society, but can I ask his advice on what families with a child suffering from a life-shortening condition uh, will receive as a result of his measures today? Because children suffering from life-limiting conditions are often at home where they need to be kept warm 24 hours a day, seven days a week, often with specialist equipment running. And the children's hospices across Scotland charity is receiving alarming calls from people whose energy bill estimates are going up in the region of £268 to £720 a month. What hope for them, Chancellor? Yeah. And Madam Deputy Speaker, in the spending review in the autumn, we announced record funding settlements, not just for health, but across the board, uh, and that resulted in Barnet consequences of, from memory, about four and a half billion pounds annually for the Scottish Government, which obviously they can use uh, to support their local communities uh, in the way that they feel best. And again, there's been further Barnets today as a result of the Household Support Fund. With a 5 cut in fuel duty, lifting the national insurance threshold and a plan to cut income tax, will my right honourable friend reiterate that this government is a tax-cutting government? Uh, on, us, on this side of the House, we trust people how best to spend their own money. Well, my, uh, my honourable friend makes an excellent point, uh, and he's absolutely right. We want people to be able to keep more of their own money. Uh, the plans announced today, the tax plan, represents the biggest net cut to personal taxes in a quarter of a century, proving that we very much are on the side of hard-working British people. Ellie Reeves. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Many of my constituents are having to choose between putting food on the table or heating their homes. And at my local food bank last week, staff told me that they were facing levels of demand they had never seen before. Mm. Meanwhile, the boss of BP's salary has increased to almost four and a half million pounds. Surely the Chancellor must see that it's time for a windfall That's tax right. on oil and gas to tackle rising energy bills. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have already addressed this, Madam Deputy Speaker. I would urge the Honourable Lady to, uh, to wait for the Prime Minister's forthcoming energy security strategy, which will ensure that British people have affordable energy, uh, secure energy, uh, and reliable energy, and most importantly, in the process, support British jobs and British investment. Robin Miller. I welcome this statement and I agree with him, the Chancellor, that this is a statement for the Union because in these uncertain and unusual times it's the strength of our economy that helps us in positions on defence, trade and more. But we are maintaining generous levels of support for devolved administrations in Scotland, in Wales and in parts of England. So it's vital that UK taxpayers can be assured that they are receiving value for money for expenditure behind devolved curtains. Is this something? that the new Cabinet Committee of Efficiency and Value for Money will be paying attention to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my uh, honourable friend makes an excellent point. I look forward to taking up his suggestion and having further conversations with him about it. And I'm glad that uh, over a million Welsh taxpayers will benefit from the announcements that we've made today. Sarah Sultana. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The richest member of Parliament just spoke about how he un understands how the cost of living crisis is impacting millions of people. But judging by what he said, that will sound like a cruel joke to people across the country. Energy bills are rocketing, while fossil fuel giants BP and Shell are set to make £40 billion in profits this year. So why has the Chancellor refused to introduce a windfall tax on these companies to fund the restoration of the old lower energy cap? Is it, Madam Deputy Speaker, because he would rather squeeze the livelihoods of ordinary people than the profits of the super-rich? Yeah. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, with regards to the livelihoods of ordinary people, they've just received a £330 tax cut today, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, and a discount on their fuel bill with more tax cuts to come. This, side, this government is on the side of hard-working British families. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about that national insurance threshold change, uh, the one that Martin, Martin Lewis has described as the big one. Uh, can my right honourable tax cutting friend confirm that this will result in an actual tax cut for more than 30 million people and, in fact, 
anyone who earns less than £35,000. Yeah, yeah. Well, my, uh, my honourable friend and constituent neighbour is absolutely right. I thank him for his support. Uh, not only will this put £330 in the pockets of 30 million hard-working British families, including many in Stockton South, but it also means that 70% of workers will be better off even accounting for the new health and care levy. Stephen Kinnett. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In his reply to my honourable friend, the member for Sheffield South East on steel, the, the Chancellor talked a lot about the steel compensation that's been paid. Whilst that is, of course, welcome, the fact is that British steelmakers are still paying 61% more than their German competitors. Steel is a foundational industry that is about good jobs, about decarbonisation, about our sovereign capability. So why is there absolutely nothing in this statement for our steel industry? So, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have existing programmes in place to support our energy intensive industries and we remain in close dialogue uh, with, uh, with all companies and all sectors. Uh, but I would say our track record on supporting industry is strong, Madam Deputy Speaker, and we continue to create jobs and make sure that British workers are well supported. Oh. French. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Chancellor's announcements today, which will help people across Old Bexley and Sidcup with the cost of living and support local businesses as our local economy recovers. Yeah. However, in stark contrast to these announcements today, people in outer London areas such as Bexley have faced an eye-watering 8.8% increase in the Labour Mayor of London's council tax preset, which we continue to see little benefit from. And even worse, now drivers and local businesses face the prospects of paying over £4,000 a year from the ULES expansion, which is clearly a tax raid with little proven environmental impact in outer London. Does he agree with me that this tax raid by Sadiq Khan on hard-working people across Bexley should be stopped. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, my uh, honourable friend makes an excellent point, uh, and even if the Labour Mayor of London is not standing up for his constituents, I know my honourable friend will stand up for his hard-working constituents in Bexley and Sidcup, uh, and he would have seen today, we are on their side, we are cutting their taxes. Vera Hobhouse. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor is still not agreeing to a windfall tax on the super profits of the oil and gas giants. Such a ta tax would hit the shareholders. It would not hit workers and their jobs. It would not hamper a business from operating successfully. Why is he protecting wealthy shareholders? Well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I feel this is getting a little repetitive, but it's because I believe that we will see more investment in British uh, industry, more investment in the North Sea, more energy security and more jobs created, uh, and I look forward to companies bringing forward those plans in, in the coming weeks and months. Alex Norris. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when levelling up was the centrepiece of the government's domestic policies. <laughs> I think people will be incredulous that we didn't hear a single mention of it from the Chancellor yes. this afternoon. He talks of low growth. Well, we have low growth because we don't unleash the potential across the regions of this country. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's time for the Chancellor to just admit levelling up is a sham. Okay. Well, I, no, ma Madam Deputy Speaker, in fact, the uh, Leveling Up Secretary's white paper was warmly welcomed, I think, from uh, actually many colleagues across this House, uh, and indeed more broadly, uh, is backed up by uh, tens of billions, not hundreds of billions, of extra funding, and indeed it's seen in our employment growth, Mr. Speaker, which has been strongest in those regions outside of London and the South East. Florence Eshinomi. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor um, reconfirmed the business rate discount for businesses up and down the country to the rateable value of £110,000. For a number of businesses in my Vauxhall constituency, they do not qualify for that. There are a number of businesses across London will not receive any benefit, did not receive any benefit during the pandemic. One of the key areas that the Chancellor could help those businesses, not just in Vauxhall but many businesses, is around the VAT cuts for businesses and tourism. We've seen record numbers of people not coming back to the tourism sector. Will the Chancellor agree that that permanent 12.5% cut will help those businesses get back on their feet? Well, actually, Madam Deputy Speaker, all the statistics show that the hospitality industry is actually recovering very well. Cash balances are healthy. Business insolvencies are down. Uh, that is in part thanks to the support that we have put in place <coughs> excuse me, behind that industry. Um, but I do think that the uncapped business rate discount will provide support to hundreds of thousands of businesses. And it's right that we target support on those who need our help most, whether it's businesses or families and individuals. Patrick Grady. 
Madam Speaker, is the humanitarian funding that he's announced for Ukraine in addition to aid flows already planned within the 0.5% budget, or is it going to have the effect of squeezing already planned expenditure elsewhere in the FCDO? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, all uh, owed renouncements are handled by the Foreign Secretary. Of course, within the overall budget, there is always uh, contingency and space for humanitarian disasters that happen on an annual basis that can't be foreseen. So it's not a question of squeezing other things out at all. It's part of planned spend. Ms. Bryan. Thank you, Speaker, I commend the government's action on Russian sanctions, but we cannot possibly think that this is job yet done. Mariupol still burns. Children are fleeing um, the bombing of their homes. Um, and we still haven't even introduced a sanction regime which is as tough as the sanction regime on Iran. So can I urge him to go a bit further? We need to sanction all the Russian banks, not just 60% of them. Yeah. We need to tackle the uh, trust funds, such as that recently set up by Alicia Usmanov, so as to protect his assets in the UK. Yeah. We need to tackle the families and the hangers-on, such as Lavrov's family, who are in the UK. And we need to tackle shipping. We must do all of these things for the people of Ukraine as fast as possible. Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, I've been working very closely with my counterparts in G7 economies and beyond to coordinate our financial and economic sanctions, which I am more responsible for, and I'm highly confident that what we've done is world-leading, uh, particularly with regard to acts on, on bank freezes. Uh, but we are constantly in dialogue with our partners to make sure that the action we take is effective when it is done coordinated. It's not, no, it's not remotely, Madam Deputy Speaker, actually. Uh, there has been good unity in this House on this topic. And for the Honourable Gentleman to claim that somehow we are behind other countries when it comes to sanctioning Russian banks is simply not true. This government is taking a leading role in doing it. Uh, we are ahead of most of our peers, and he doesn't know that I know because I'm in the conversation with the finance ministers about where else they are prepared to go. I'm very confident that we have done a lot and have played a leading role internationally in bringing others along with us. Stephen Farron. Uh, thank you very much. Um, whenever the Chancellor has been trying to excuse his failure to increase benefits in line with inflation, he's referred to situations such as the universal credit taper and the national living wage, which, have, which help those people on benefits who are in work. However, does the Chancellor recognise that the majority of people on benefits in the UK are not in work and there's nothing in this budget to help them? Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, Honourable Gentleman missed the Household Support Fund announcement, which is specifically for local councils to help those who are most vulnerable. Uh, and there is many of those people who are not currently in work, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, but with the right support, care and attention can be supported into work, and that is also what this Government is spending a lot to do. Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Today the Welsh Government has announced a £500 payment to unpaid family carers to recognise their commitment during the pandemic. Unpaid carers in Scotland already receive carer supplement. Meanwhile, carers in England get a miserly carer's allowance, increasing only by £2 this year. Not only does this mean that the sacrifice and commitment of unpaid carers in England is going unrewarded, but carers are being driven further into financial hardship. How many more need to be pushed into poverty before this government acts to value carers and give them the targeted support they deserve? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, we do value carers. There are fewer people in poverty today than when uh, we first came into office. And again, uh, yes, that, that is 1.7 uh, million people fewer in absolute poverty than before uh, than, than 2010, after housing costs. Uh, but also, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have created today or uh, topped up the Household Support Fund to provide support to those most vulnerable who need help. Sam Terry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This week it was revealed that 75% of people in my constituency in Ilford South are struggling to pay for basic groceries. Today, after this statement, the OBR's analysis has said that we are now facing the largest fall in disposable incomes since the 1950s. I'd like to ask Madam Deputy Speaker whether the Chancellor might visit my constituency, sit down with the people that use that food bank, many of which are in work, and understand just how little the policies announced today are going to do anything to support them get them into work and allow them to live with dignity in their communities. <coughs> well, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is simply wrong. For those people in work, particularly on low incomes, they will benefit disproportionately from the policies that have been announced today. I've given plenty of examples already, but let's a single mother with two children renting on universal credit, working full time on the national living wage, will be £1,600 better off as a result of all the policies uh, that we've announced on taxes and welfare. So I do believe we are supporting exactly the people that he talks about. Deirdre Brock. Oh, 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the Climate Change Committee's estimates suggest the overall price tag for retrofitting the UK's homes, considered some of the most leaky and energy inefficient in Europe, uh, is £27 billion a year over the next 25 years. Will he recognise that this needs real commitment and investment, not just tinkering around the edges? Yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, in the spending review, uh, we announced the largest amount of investment in upgrading home energy efficiency this country has ever seen. Billions and billions of pounds across a range of different schemes, helping hundreds of thousands of households uh, with the cost of upgrading their energy. Barry Gardner. Yeah. Can, yeah. can the Chancellor explain? why it is that in the fifth richest country in the world, under his stewardship, this morning's news reported that a mother would not accept potatoes from a food bank because she didn't have enough money to boil them. Shame on you. Shame. Well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I'm very sorry to hear that, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, in fact, confident that the policies we've announced today will help those who are most vulnerable. In the same way that we have over the last two years, uh, we've made sure that we stand by the British people, uh, and that's what the policies announced today do. Karen Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm old enough to remember the rampant inflation of the 1990s as, we, as I started my career. I'm old enough to remember Ted Heath's uh, government when we had to uh, go to the local cafe because we didn't have the lights on in the house. But I'm not old enough to remember Anthony Eden and the 1950s. What does the Chancellor have to say today to pensioners who worked their lives through the 1950s that he is now presiding over the greatest falling living standards since that time? Well, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, I, I'm pleased that because of the actions of Conservative-led governments in 2010, the state pension is £2,000 uh, higher today, £700 of that, specifically because of the triple op, showing that this government is on the side of pensioners. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. So the Chancellor is proposing to cut the value of state social security payments by at least 4% and putting up tax rates for those on average and below average incomes. And yet he refuses even to countenance asking those who have extreme wealth or the corporations that are making obscene profits to pay a little bit more. Isn't the truth, Chancellor, that this is just a plan to increase inequality in the United Kingdom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are asking uh, companies, especially large successful companies, to pay more. That was announced last year, legislated for, will come into force next year. Uh, the corporation tax rate will rise from 19 to 25 per cent to ensure that we do spread the burden fairly in recovering from coronavirus. Emma Lewis, but Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Household Support Fund only exists because, thanks to this Chancellor, people do not have enough income to eat or pay their bills. With pensions and benefits set to rise by a measly 3.1 per cent, the minimum wage by 59 pence, and inflation peaking at over 7 per cent, today's uplift to the fund is more evidence of his continued failure to protect the hardest hit, isn't it? Madam Deputy Speaker, the national living wage is actually going up by 6.6 per cent. It's one of the highest increases we've seen in the national living wage, and it will mean that someone working full time on the national living wage earns £1,000 more this year. Jamie Stone. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The village of Aldahara in my constituency is the coldest place in the UK every single winter, and a great number of households in my constituency rely on domestic fuel for their heating. They have absolutely no choice. And right now, right now, they're faced with crippling bills landing on their doorsteps. Now, I don't want the Chancellor to feel he has to repeat himself, but I wonder if I could ask, in the spirit of goodwill and cooperation, would the Chancellor agree to me meeting with some of his ministerial team to look at different ways where we could tackle this precise problem, which is hurting my constituents in the coldest part of Britain very badly indeed? So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm always happy to hear suggestions from the Honourable Gentleman, indeed, uh, to arrange a meeting for him. I wanted to make sure that those off the gas grid still benefited from the energy package that we put in place in February, and, uh, and it will work on electricity meters, so that will happen. But as a rural uh, MP myself, I appreciate, uh, the, um, uh, I appreciate the issue that he raises, uh, and will happily arrange the meeting for him. Richard Bergen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Oil and gas giants are making £900 profit per second per second, whilst at the same time millions of people are having sleepless nights worrying if they're going to be able to heat their homes. Does the Chancellor think 
that the rights of these firms to make these super profits is more important than the rights of people to stay warm. And if not, then surely now is the time for a windfall tax on these profits to fund lowering people's energy bills. Uh, just to remind the honourable gentleman, we do already have a supplementary corporation tax on oil and gas companies. It's, they pay 40% corporation tax. It's twice as much as the rate paid by all other uh, companies. Uh, it's right that they do, uh, but also going forward, as the Prime Minister's strategy will outline, we want to see more investment in the North Sea, more British energy security, and more British jobs. Ms. Cadbury. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Private sector tenants on low income in my constituency are, are facing ever rising rents, which are in many cases well above the local housing allowance levels. These are people on universal credit, many of whom, uh, over half of whom, are working families, having to make the choice whether to eat or heat. What assessment is the Chancellor making about the levels of local housing allowance so that my constituents are not having to top up uh, from their non-housing element two, three and four hundred pounds a month in order to pay their rent? Well, because of the increases to local housing allowance that this government put in place, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, for the pandemic and has maintained, about one and a half million people, the poorest in our society, will have £600 a year more uh, in local housing allowance, which will help. Uh, she talked about a family on low income, so that she's aware, uh, a, a family with two children, with someone working full time, the other working part time on the national living wage and renting. As a result of all the tax and welfare changes we've made, including the taper and national living wage, will be about £3,000 better off, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I know that that will help them through the challenging months ahead. Alan Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Brownings the bakers uh, make, make sell uh, products and distribute them right across the UK through some, uh, the, some of the major UK supermarkets. I wrote to the Chancellor highlighting that their electricity costs have increased from £4,000 a week to £11,000 a week. And if they want fixed cost, it's an eye water £17,000 a week they've been offered for a two year contract. Now, obviously, the, the Treasury makes more money in VAT returns out of these eye water increases. So rather than a chance for having to write back to me, can they confirm to me here and now that I can tell John Gall, the managing director, that he's doing nothing to help businesses like Brownings and Bakers? Well, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is simply wrong on VAT. If he looks at the figures published today, he will see that the OBR's estimate of VAT receipts in this forthcoming year are actually lower than the amount that they had expected uh, in the autumn. And we are providing a tax cut for small businesses today, £1,000 due to the increase in the employment allowance, and that will kick in in just a couple of weeks. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As always, the Chancellor has forgotten the poorest. Those claiming pensions those claiming social security and those living below the minimum income threshold hit by the cost of living crisis. All my poorest constituents want is food, warmth and shelter against soaring house prices. All they got was 6p a day from the housing support fund on average. So will the Chancellor go back again and review the rise in social security payments? They need that money or else they're going to go hungry they're going to experience hyperthermia and they'll be homeless. You know, it's important that the questions are very brief at this stage if I'm going to get the last few people in. Chancellor Dick Shecker. Uh, well, well, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, with regard to supporting those who are homeless, the special